good day good morning good afternoon good evening to all the participants uh, we've uh, got persons from all around the world uh, of course captain ashok is in singapore we are in a lot of us are from uh, india but there are a lot of persons who are in japan who are in uk uh, as well who have joined in um, thank you uh, everyone today's webinar uh, today's discussion will be on opportunities in commercial shipping we've had a poll wherein we have asked you about uh, if you can see the presentation i think most of us can see the presentation and there is another poll on where did you hear about the webinar from which uh, almost everyone has answered um i will move on and go to the next slide uh, next slide please shalom all right um so why we are doing this webinar and what's the purpose of uh, of, of doing the webinar um a lot of times we have a aspiration uh, uh, we want to get into a particular field but uh, what does this field entail how to enter into it we it's only hearsay we know from a friend of a friend of a friend uh, which may be right may not be right so what cn beyond through this initiative is trying to do is increase your awareness provide you consolidated information from credible sources persons who have been at our position persons who have excelled um, and persons who are at a, who want to give back to the society uh, or or our community as such um this will help you to evaluate the relevance of the information towards yourself uh, and then and which is the vision of cn beyond help you taking well informed decision so uh, through these webinars we have we try to increase your awareness and help you take well informed decisions some do's and don'ts in the webinar please um you might have a lot of questions but try and wait till the end of the webinar to submit your question uh once you have your question or or if you think that the question may not have been answered then submit your question in the chat window but we will take all the queries after the webinar finishes our focus will be on you but we've got already got about 100 odd participants uh, try and make uh, your um, uh, answer a little bit more um uh, or or question a little bit more generic uh, instead of being very specific to yourself um we will share the presentation with you uh, later in the job uh, after the after the web webinar finishes and uh, just one more request if you could rename yourself rename yourself to uh, your real name not the name of your uh, mobile or laptop or maybe a family member name uh we move on to the next slide shallo all right um it's a pleasure and absolute honor to have you captain sharma um, deliver this presentation for us and i'm sure uh, you know with persons like me many like us will really benefit uh, a lot uh, i'm brief about captain sharma he started his career in 1982 with great eastern and he worked his way up from a decade he was there for 10 years and then he moved to omi wherein he worked for 10 years and he was a master and an ops manager um his journey into commercial shipping started uh, you know uh, from after omi after leaving omi and has been for 21 years uh, he's worked in these 21 years he's worked with the bremer jm bakshi marshall produced brokers before and then he set up brs bakshi far east as managing director in singapore so right now in his current position he's the executive head of the company he's responsible for the revenue and profitability and uh, uh, for the expansion and growth as well uh, uh, i mean in, in every which way geographically and uh, in and then through revenue and profitability as well uh, captain ashok uh, is a master mariner of course and uh, he's a member of institute of uh, chartered ship brokers and uh, he's done his bachelor's of science from university of mumbai um thank you captain sharma again for uh, uh, for being uh, here i uh, while i've uh, introduced you i'll take a introduction from the audience as well so i'm launching a poll uh, for everyone and this poll is what is your rank so are you top four sailing um are you sailing at an operations level 
are you settled ashore after a sailing background or you have settled ashore but you do not have a sailing background so uh, please reply uh, on this poll window and i'll share the results of the poll so we all know what kind of audience uh, we have and of course captain sharma would also know that yeah thanks gorov uh, look forward to addressing this uh, this gathering uh, i know uh, i can well imagine uh, uh, i i go back about how many years now 20 odd years uh, when i was in a similar situation uh, sailing and uh, looking to uh, looking to find a position ashore and i know how um, i know how heart wrenching how gut wrenching how stressful it can be and unfortunately about i'm talking about early 2000s we didn't have this guidance we are, well it's it's a great in initiative you've taken to um, you know to uh, have this webinar and get people with experience who've been through the grind and explaining to people how it works and I'm, I'm sure it makes it doesn't make it any easier uh, getting a job ashore although i believe now the jobs ashore uh, are far greater in number than they used to be in our time the opportunities are far greater but uh, anyway it, it's still it's still pretty tough i think to break in uh, from a sailing career to a, to a career show but uh, i'll do whatever little i can to help sure sir i'm i'm, I'm 100% sure all of us would benefit from your guidance and i've had a good very good uh, you know uh, uh, throughput from the poll so we've got 92% who have answered the poll um, so within the persons who are attending the webinar, we've got 56% who are top four sailing. Um, then is 20% who are settled ashore, but with a sailing background. We've got at an operations level sailing persons of about 18% and uh, was settled ashore without any sailing background about 6%. So majorly 94% mariners, uh, majorly persons who have top four um, uh, experiences, what the audience is uh, today. Right. Uh, we go to the next slide, uh, Shalom. All right. Quickly, I'll share the agenda of the uh, webinar today. So we'll talk about, you know, just what is commercial shipping, who are the key stakeholders, key roles within commercial shipping, entry points and progression, personality and education required, an overview of what are the changes happening um, and the prospects in the coming time. So that's essentially what we are going to talk uh, uh, in this uh, webinar. Um, to the next slide, Shalom. Okay. Um, I'm launching another poll. And this poll is your awareness on commercial shipping. What do you think? Uh, at, at what level are you? Um, so uh, you know, the, you know the, the four options over here. Uh, you know the remuneration, uh, but don't know the entry points. You know the growth prospects and have interacted with commercial persons. Your friend is working or you don't have much of an idea. Whatever, I mean, uh, place you are, whatever your position is, do let us know. It will help us in kind of uh, making it more specific to the kind of audience uh, that we have. Right, we've got about 80% of you who have voted. I look forward to another, till 90%, I would look forward to have the polling answers. All right, uh, let me share the results. So 46% of the audience, they do not have much of an idea about uh, commercial shipping. 34% uh, they know it's extremely remunerative which is why it becomes so aspirational uh, but they're probably not sure about the entry points uh, rest uh, uh, they know a person who is working there or, or a friend of a friend so so that's uh, where we are in terms of the audience uh, um, Captain Ashok uh, I've stopped sharing the results now and uh, over to the next slide Shalu and then over to you uh, Should I start? Yes, sir. Please, over to you now. Okay. Uh, now, uh, all of you are here uh, with an interest in, uh, in commercial shipping. And uh, I'm presuming that uh, all of you are uh, 
have an aspiration to uh, make the switch from a non-commercial job into to a commercial uh, uh, to a job that uh, involves uh, uh, activities or functions within the commercial uh, shipping segment. Okay, let me just start off with uh, giving you uh, giving you an idea of uh, giving you my uh, interpretation of what commercial shipping is. Uh, so uh, here goes now. Merchant ships are a business enterprise in which revenues are generated by renting out the space on a ship. So all of us who've sailed on merchant ships were facilitating the earning of revenue from a ship by letting its space out, by renting the space on the ship out. The remuneration or the compensation for renting the space out on a ship is called the freight. The all the functions that are involved in supporting uh, the earning of freight on a ship can broadly be termed as uh, being as uh, being in the segment called uh, uh, or what we uh, being in the segment uh, which we are uh, labeling as a commercial shipping. It's a very generic term, but commercial shipping deals with revenue earnings, a and uh, what we have to understand is that freight is the only revenue stream for the owner. So anybody who's connected with freight, earning of freight, uh, fixing of voyages that eventually will end up uh, uh, earning freight, uh, going in for you know collection of freight, uh, documentation, everything, uh, they are all involved in commercial shipping. They are in the commercial shipping department of uh, ship owners, uh, office. Of course, a ship does generate additional revenue uh, when it is sold or scrapped, but that is not the scope of uh, this particular presentation. So that's a highly specialized field and it's not necessary that uh, HC seafarers uh, get into that stream. That, that happens. Uh, that's a highly specialized niche field. It, it probably uh, deserves, um, it probably deserves uh, a separate presentation altogether. Hence, the, the commercial aspect of shipping broadly entails with revenue earning activity, that is freight, okay? All of us here are focused, if you want to work in the commercial department of a ship, you're focused on the freight part of it, one way or the other, and you'll be surprised how many, uh, you'll be surprised how many um, verticals, uh, how many uh, how many uh, departments or how many personnel in um, in a shipping ship owner's office are focused on uh, earning a freight yeah next uh, next slide please now who are the participants in the freight markets now generally like i told you that uh, a ship's activity the main commercial activity is earning freight and uh, the a freight market is a market on its own it's a market on its own and uh, let me just broadly uh, quickly uh, point out or uh, just uh, list uh, a brief list of uh, who there could be a lot of uh, there could be other players involved in this but these are the broad uh, uh, participants in the in the freight market we call it the chartering market right uh, a chartering market uh, a, a chartering market is the market which you go into to get employment for a ship to earn freight for a ship so they're called uh, freight chartering departments. So there are three main players there, uh, main entities, the business entities involved in um, earning of freight or the freight markets. One of the charters. Uh, charters are the people who, who are the owners or controllers of, of the cargo transportation. Now, they could be owners of the cargo as well. Uh, we are talking about uh, probably, uh, you know, oil companies. Uh, I, I'm a tanker broker. So I've sailed an oil tanker most of my life. So the example that comes most readily to my mind are oil companies, Shell, Chevron, Exxon, Total, Indian Oil Corporation, BPCL. These people are all charters. It's complex because the same people can act as owners as well. But right now, just suffice it to say, a person, an entity that controls the cargo is, is normally the charter. Then there are owners. Entities that affect ownership control of the ship, entities that own the ship are called, uh, are what we broadly term as owners. 
like I said, it could get great, very complicated. We could get make it uh, much more complex and have a very, uh, uh, very uh, minute, uh, micro kind of uh, discussion, which I have. I'll, I can explain to you how charters become owners, and at time owners become charters. But just let's leave that aside. Uh, I'll be happy to, at some later stage in life, to explain these uh, nuances to you. Then uh, the third uh, broad category who are uh, the major part, the main participants in uh, freight markets are brokers. Brokers are middlemen. And I say middlemen because they are normally between, uh, they are, they normally establish the connection between owners and charters. Uh, they find uh, the charter owns a cargo. The broker takes the cargo to the market and tries to find a ship uh, to carry the cargo. And the owner has a ship. At the same time, he could go to the broker and say, hey, listen, I have a ship. Please find uh, employment for this ship for me. So then he takes a ship to the market, uh, interacting with his, uh, with his network and tries to find employment for the ship. So... A charterer, a broker finds employment uh, for a ship that's not employed or tries to find a ship to carry a cargo which needs a ship, uh, which needs a ship to carry. So uh, when I say price discovery, uh, you know, I say brokers, middlemen in the shipping industry who play a crucial role in price discovery because the owners, are, uh, the brokers are pivotal in the negotiation between charters and owners. Every voyage is fixed at a particular, uh, at a particular freight rate. And of course, a set of terms that freight rate and those terms are negotiated through the broker and every voyage has a unique freight rate. It has a unique set of terms and unique set of commercial circumstances uh, surrounding it. So every every negotiation is different and brokers are the one who are, who uh, enable. So, uh, we don't I mean, brokers don't really brokers are enablers. So brokers enable a price to be set for a particular voyage by interlocuting between charters and owners. Brokers form an integral segment of chartering networks globally. And uh, it's very difficult. Uh, and uh, brokers have brokers are amongst the oldest uh, players in the, uh, in the chartering field. And uh, I'm talking from, from historical times. And it's not very easy to do away with broker, work with brokers. Because uh, chartering is still very much, uh, uh, very much a personal, uh, a personality-oriented business. It's it's a personal relationships, knowledge of the business, geographical knowledge, local knowledge, domain knowledge, and stuff like that. <coughs> Thanks. Can go to the next slide, please. Sure. Um, we'll have a poll now, and uh, we have two questions in this poll. Um, and you can write your answers over here. Uh, what attracts you most about this field? Right, that's the first one wherein you can write uh, whatever you feel. And uh, then uh, 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 there is a match the following wherein you rate these fields as per starting salaries. So which, uh, uh, which one do you feel uh, either ship management, logistics or commercial would have the highest um, salary? Uh, starting salary, not the end salary, but at, at what you start, uh, which one do you feel would have the uh, highest starting salaries? So the second question is even more interesting. Which of these three fields do you feel has the highest starting salary? Commercial, logistics, ship management. All right, we've got two minutes in the poll now. Uh, I still see a few more answers coming in, but let me wait for the next five, six seconds and then I'll uh, end the poll, please. Um, right, guys, I'm, I'm ending the poll. Um, let me share the results as well. Now, uh, what I see is that almost 67% of us feel or 71% of us feel that commercial, the starting salary is the highest. 13% um, um, of us feel that 
uh, in logistics, the starting salary is the highest. Um, and 14% of us feel that in ship management, the starting salary is the highest. So, 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 so that's essentially uh, what we feel, uh, what the audience uh, uh, feels, sir. Um, Show me the results. I can't see the results. Um, so you'll have to go and click on, uh, if you just go on commercial, if you take your mouse over there. Um, commercial where? Um, just on the answer, there is num number three commercial. If just you take uh, take your mouse on oh, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. So you'll see 71% feel that commercial guys earn the highest starting salaries. Uh, and then if you take the same mouse to logistics, then you'll see that 13% of logistics guys, 13% uh, of us feel that logistic guys earn the highest salary and 14% of us feel that ship management has the highest starting salary. Um, I'll stop sharing the uh, poll now and I'll let you, you know, summarize and maybe advise everyone on the, you know, on the salaries and then we could possibly go on the next slide or, or, or the entry points if you would like to do it now. Yeah. Okay. So as far as salaries are concerned, uh, Starting salary wise, I think uh, it's probably a technical superintendent or a marine superintendent with some experience as a master or a chief engineer or a second engineer who would probably draw the highest starting salary. Uh, a commercial salary again is very, very, again, now commercial, like I told you, uh, there, there's no real profile for a commercial uh, executive in either a broking house or a charter's office or owner's office. They could start as fresh graduates. They could be, they could be people like me who entered uh, after 20 years of being at sea, which is rare. It doesn't happen anymore. I was one of the uh, few who probably did it then. There are much better ways of doing it now. So I feel that ship management will probably pay you the highest starting. The commercial, uh, like I said, is variable, but at the beginning, as a raw commercial hand, uh, you'd probably get uh, a salary probably lower than or, or probably as low as anybody in the logistics sports agency sector. But the gradient in a commercial is very, very high. So depending on how good you are and how successful you are in generating revenues for the company. So I would believe that the long term prospects for commercial are the best. I, I totally agree, sir. And with you know CNB and also being in the recruitment field, um, the I, we see the starting salaries in commercial that probably half of the salaries that in a ship management that you get. But the gradient, as you said, is extremely high. In three five years, you are I mean we are at the same level, and then uh, you know the gap keeps on increasing uh, in in the commercial space. I'll give you my example. Uh, it happened a long time ago, but uh, I was a master on a ULCC when I finally stopped sailing. And in those days, I think my salary, I was a ULCC master with 10 years, 10 years seniority, 10 years, 10 increments. And uh, my salary on the ULCC was 6,600 a month, which in 2002 was a fairly decent salary. But when I came ashore, my first salary was 20,000 rupees a month <laughs> in a commercial room. <laughs> so, uh, unless you prove yourself commercially, because a commercial role requires you to be have the ability to generate revenues. So, unless you have a proven track record, nobody you're not going to get rewarded for it. Sure, right, sir. Thanks, thanks for the insight, uh, Captain Saurav. I see you have raised your hand. Uh, can we take? Um, you know, uh, we will have you speak and take your question at the end of the webinar, please. Um, we can move to the next slide, Shalu. Okay, here are the main uh, uh, employment opportunities ashore. I mean, what are the main jobs that are available? Okay, uh, chartering executives or brokers. These are the market-facing uh, personnel, the guys on a day-to-day -day basis who are involved in uh, the uh, fixing of it. We call... Uh, getting employment for a ship or finalizing employment for a ship or the process of uh, gaining employment for a ship, we call it fixing of a ship. So uh, people involved or the personnel involved in uh, fixing of ships, essentially uh, the frontline guys are the chartering executives or brokers. 
they are uh, they are market facing personnel in owners and charters offices they interact with brokers and are involved in day to day chartering activities or day to day fixing activities talking to the market looking for cargoes pushing the ships positions they they also they they also they they sometimes a lot of people in some european shops especially they also called brokers they in the charters and owners office uh, they 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 are, they are referred to as brokers so brokers in chartering offices talking to brokers in broking shops and sometimes talking to each other directly uh, charters uh, or charters broker uh, employees of charters or brokers of charters and brokers of owners talking to each other directly but they are the market facing people the ringside view of the market and they are the participants then uh, you have operations executives they are personnel who assist uh, the chartering executives like the char uh, chartering executives and owners uh, and uh, charters offices in providing information and liaising with the ship while negotiating a contract like when you are negotiating a contract for a ship a lot of stuff comes up like what are the approvals of a ship and talk from from a tanker perspective what are the dimensions can the ship is the ship suitable for this berth can she load this cargo does her cargo equipment have this uh, have this certification or this capacity or whatever so it's the uh, so it's the uh, operations people who assist in that then once the ship is finally fixed the contract is finalized then the operations executives are responsible for monitoring and coordinating the ex uh, execution of the voyage the operations is a whole department when i talk about operations executives of course there's a hierarchy you have an operations manager a fleet operations manager and everything but uh, that is the department that is uh, that is responsible for monitoring the execution of the voyage making sure everything uh, making sure everything is uh, going as per the the charter party agreement the contract between a ship owner and a charter or a ship and uh, a ship owner and a charter is called a charter party it's an ancient term again you guys can look up google and find out why but it has something to do with royalty the, the, you know the monarchy in england and stuff like that so of course that's again like a separate presentation on a separate subject altogether then you have uh, people uh, then the third the third uh, major category of uh, personnel in a in a commercial shipping uh, segment are claims executives now uh, remember the freight or the ship uh, is fixed for for a particular voyage and for a particular freight and once the freight is paid then uh, there are several other uh, there are several other revenues or several other payments several other uh, reimbursements so to say so as per the charter party that uh, need to be uh, collected by the ship owner and uh, that aspect is followed up by claims executives and uh, that is demurrages it could be war risk premiums it, it could be port costs it could be anything but that's generally claims executives follow it up and the claims executives the life of a claim is far outlives the the, uh, the length of the voyage the length of the vo the voyage may just last maybe 20 days 25 days 30 days but claims could last several months and in many many cases several years as well so a claims executive has to follow all that up it's uh, not as exciting and uh, you know as with it uh, of a ch uh, like a chartering job or an even operation operation jobs are fairly exciting because they 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 are dealing real time with the execution of the work right but claims are very very important because they make a big difference to the earnings of a ship because remember when the chartering executive fixes a ship he also uh, he also incorporates uh, revenue in terms of the claims that the charter will have to pay back to the ship owner after the voyage is complete so the claims executive basically completes the loop and make sure the entire earnings from a particular voyage are collected as far as the owner is concerned now every entity in the industry including broking houses now when i said charters and owners okay i started off mainly with that but broking houses like our company as well we also have these executives we have a claims executive we have operations executive we have chartering executives and brokers so broking houses also have uh, these positions uh, that are uh, that are manned uh, to carry out day to day business uh, next next slide please okay so the, what do we require as a, as an employer what, what am i looking for or well what are my counterparts in a, in a, in a broking house or a charter a chartering chartering entity or a ship owning entity what are we looking for when we are hiring a person 
Now, a chartering executive or a broker, he can literally come from any as any uh, from any background, literally. A trading background. He could be a. He could be a. You know, he could be a salesman in an insurance company. He, uh, you know, he. Basically, what we're looking for in a chartering executive or a broker is the ability to sell, because you're selling a service. It's not necessary for a broker or for a ship owner or a charter to use your service. So it's very important for a chartering executive or a broker to be able to sell, uh, sell the service that he is going to provide. So a sales-oriented personality is extremely important. Now, supporting a sales-oriented personality, and I think that is the most important thing that anybody looks for, hiring a chartering executive or a broker. But uh, basically what we would require, or I would require from a chartering executive or a broker is an analytical mind, being able to, being able to think out of the box, being able to put together a host of myriad circumstances come to a, you know and how those are how those are affecting your market because uh, especially nowadays it's it's very easy if you just look out the window uh, you see uh, there are so many extraneous factors to shipping that are impacting the shipping markets like what the houthis the kind of chaos the houthis are creating in the red sea and uh, that's typical of a geopolitical uh, event uh, which brokers have to deal with on a day to day basis and uh, the ukraine war in the black sea so uh, these kind of things are uh, very important to incorporate in the market view. We need a broker, a chartering executive to have an outgoing personality. He should like people, like talking to people, be engaging. People should like talking to him. You should have social skills. Yes, partying and uh, socializing is a big aspect of the job. A determination to succeed is very because a highly competitive job. Uh, you probably just uh, if I mean if you if you convert ten percent of the opportunities that are presented to you, uh, you 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 are actually doing a very very good job. Uh, you should be have an ability to build a network uh, within the market. A uh, certain amount of you know the people who who like you or people who talk to you, uh, people whom you engage with on a regular basis and engage information. People who give you business. Uh, the ability to uh, source market information, very important. Chartering market is a very dynamic market. Things are happening all the time, 24-7. It doesn't happen on weekends, thank God. But uh, weekdays, yes, it's happening all the time. It's very important to keep, uh, it's very important to keep uh, abreast of what's happening in the market. Your negotiating skills have to be excellent. I mean, if you're not a good negotiator, there's no place for you as a chartering executive or broker. You should be able to bridge the gap between... Uh, bridge the gap that exists between, say, the buyer, the buyer of the freight and the seller of the freight. That's as a broker, but any chartering executive needs that skill. And of course, you should uh, he should have a very good in-depth knowledge of the charter party, the, the various contracts that govern the carriage of goods, various charter party clauses. An operations uh, person has, an, uh, for an operations person, I would typically look for a person with experience, seeing how experience would be good. Uh, excellent communication skills because everything is done over the phone and email and uh, so we need people to be able to put their points of view across and uh, you know make uh, and, and paint a very clear picture of what's happening we need and we need the operations person to have a very good working knowledge of the chart party uh, contracts as well for claims, we need a person with an organized mind, a, a very good, strong work ethic, uh, you know, uh, which uh, doesn't uh, leave any cracks through which important uh, aspects can fall through. Uh, a claims executive can can cause a lot of loss uh, to a company if uh, they don't follow up uh, in an organized manner. It's a very crucial function, I told you, because claims far outlive the duration of the voyage itself, and we need somebody focusing uh, on the uh, on the collection of uh, dues when the voyage is over. Yeah, so next, please. Next slide, please. Mm. I think we have a poll. Uh, and the poll is, what are your views on entry in commercial shipping? So what do you think? How would the entry in commercial shipping be extremely hard? Few survive, need strong education, credentials, very strong network. Many opportunities are available, but no one takes, uh, uh, I mean, uh, 
uh, it's difficult to get in. By the way, sir, the way you dis uh, describe the persona of a broker, uh, you know, it seems straight out of a Bollywood movie, you know, a person who is suave, uh, you know, likes to socialize, um, good negotiation skills, can, you know, quickly negotiate contracts, get the deal done. So, so, so I mean, uh, as it is, persons want to get into commercial shipping, but of all the three, probably brokers is where it seems the most stressful and uh, probably, uh, you know, where, where there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, aspirations also that persons have to get into that role. So a lot of hard work involved. I mean, <laughs> that sounds very flashy the way you put it, but probably I missed out. There's a lot of grinding hard work involved. And it's it, it, it tends to be a very, it's probably the most frustrating job in a, in the shipping industry, especially a broker. A very difficult job. Yeah. But it's rewarding as well. So it all depends on what your bent of mind is. Now you said if uh, you are a successful broker if you are able to convert 10% of the leads. So which tells us that, uh, you know, uh, how stressful it would be. Which means 90% may not get converted. And you're, you're, a very, you're a very successful broker if you convert 10%. <laughs> right, right. So... We've got uh, uh, almost 75% who have answered this poll and I, I, I see a trend and let me end the poll and uh, um, share results. So we've got 69% uh, of the audience who thinks that you need a very strong network and influence to get an entry into the commercial shipping. Next is 28% who feel it's extremely hard and very few survive. Um, then comes uh, many opportunities available, but no one takes us and then need strong education credentials. Let us know your uh, uh, take on this, please. Again, I can't see the results. Um, one second. Let me... Anyhow, okay. Uh, let, let me just... Uh... The I I believe uh, the uh, the sharpest people in the shipping industry are commercial people, right? I mean, I'm uh, I'm I'm just telling you a truth. At the end of the day, we have to earn money. Earning money is not a joke, right? So you need the best minds within the industry focused on an activity which actually helps the industry not only thrive but survive, right? So the entry into, uh, like the to make an entry into commercial shipping, you have to go past this barrier of extremely shrewd people who themselves have made, uh, who themselves have made a place for themselves who survived in the industry and probably know what it takes to survive in the industry. Because it's, it's, I think it's much easier to get an entry into the industry in the commercial, I'm talking maybe as a broker, than to survive there, right? Or in the chartering, you can make horrible mistakes because uh, especially in tankers, the chartering activity is, uh, you know, it's over in 30 minutes, 40 minutes, 45 minutes. Uh, a multi-million dollar voyage is fixed in 45 minutes, 50 minutes. So you have to be very quick thinking. And if you made a mistake in that, you left something crucial out, there can be major losses to, uh, there can be major losses to bear. So the, the, as far as revenue earning is concerned, yes, there are very sharp people in the industry and uh, they are hard nosed. And what they look for in a person is, yes, that person should add value in the sense that he should be, that he or she should be uh, effective in earning revenues for the company. As far as operations is concerned, I told you it's uh, it's uh, you need. I, I would go in for a person with experience, with hands-on experience, who can actually visualize a voyage and manage a voyage remotely from the uh, <coughs> sorry, manage a voyage remotely from the office of the charter or the owner or whatever it is. So, uh, so that's the basic distinction between uh, a broker or, or say a chartering executive and an operations executive. It's it it is and it is a very I told you it's it, it's very personality driven in the sense that uh, networking is uh, in the entire shipping industry actually networking is very important because trust is a very important issue in shipping 
because remember most of the time you're dealing with each other only with phone and email and uh, you know very often that uh, you commit yourself verbally to a major major contract before following it up with uh, a document uh, that supports the contract so trust is a major issue there i mean i would i i i would i would work with somebody only whom i trust right or if i know somebody or, you know i have some kind of connection with them they, that it makes that relationship that much easier to to sustain so yes uh, it is a fact that uh, if somebody knows somebody knows somebody knows somebody uh, that person will probably find it easier to get a job within the industry and not only in, in commercial especially it it's in other aspects also but that's only because trust is at a premium in the shipping industry we need to be able to trust what the other person is saying or the other person to deliver so i won't i won't say it's particularly you need need very strong network and influence but that influence is normally used uh, you, you know you can use your influence to get uh, somebody who's wholly unsuitable for the job but at the end of the day only you will have egg on your face after that you know because that guy fails miserably in performing that job so even that influence is used uh, with a lot of discretion will this guy be able to manage or not so although what he's saying is not what that person would need very strong influence what he's saying is not wrong but it is an important aspect of hiring people in fact most most organizations uh, globally all the biggest ones whether it's apple or google all these guys they all depend so much on internal references so it's an open thing so this is what this is the internal reference uh, methodology of shipping you know, as far as hiring people is concerned and many opportunities are available and no one takes us is again it's that trust issue in the sense do we know how do we know you're going to see at the end of the day what you have to understand is that uh, shipping is capital intensive but it is not labor intensive the kind of responsibility the kind of fiscal the financial responsibility and the uh, and the overall responsibility that hand that's on the shoulders of an individual is onerous it's huge i mean just think of how many 30 35 year olds uh, all over the world have a 200 million dollar or 150 or 300 million dollar financial responsibility on their shoulder which the captain of a ship does now it is right and falls just squarely on his shoulders on a day to day basis so that is why people are uh, a little bit circumspect about hiring and stuff like you, you it's 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 something that one cannot uh, one cannot uh, shy away from sure sir make makes makes a lot of sense uh, and uh, while you were speaking i mean uh, i i uh, what i realized is that in most of the other industries uh, there is one person who would sell uh, another person who would maybe negotiate another person who would execute uh, another person who would deliver and in commercial shipping what i'm seeing is that there's only you know those set of persons uh, in, in the commercial shipping who would essentially you know uh, network uh, increase business who would sell negotiate deliver um, uh, also in a way that at least uh, the, the contract is delivered so yeah i mean uh, the, so the responsibility yeah, that... it's not capital intensive uh, yeah. i'm sorry it's not uh, labor intensive it's a very very lean most shipping organizations are lean Right. right and every ship uh, we have something uh, if you go through a uh, ship owner's balance sheet every ship has something called g and a expenses the general administration expenses which uh, people try to keep to the lowest possible and that general administration expenses are essentially cost as far as people are concerned so every ship has to sustain the number of people looking after it so that you try to keep the number of ship people to a minimum and that's why you want you want to find uh, that's why you uh, that's why you want to find uh, people who are uh, who are self starters who can take on responsibility on their own you know and uh, they don't need to they don't need backups and stuff like that so and that of course it all again boils down to trust and a track record and stuff like that. how many times have i told you god oh, i need somebody with a track record the reason is because that is what generates some degree of trust in the system absolutely it's a very small industry everybody knows everybody i mean if i need to find out something about any one of these guys here on the list i'll have to make maybe two or three phone calls to find out that's all because it's a very small industry so even if somebody is using their discretion or influence to hire somebody that person is going to make sure he is hiring the right person for that particular job correct excellent right shall we go to the next slide
Okay, how do we get into this business? Uh, this this uh, this whole circus of the commercial shipping industry. Uh, an ideal entry point for a seafarer, and mainly uh, I'm talking a commercial. That's why it's, it's deck officers who are more suited to commercial functions. There are a few engineers who are in uh, the commercial world, but deck officers far outnumber engineers in this. Uh, the reason is because deck officers, you know, we go through, uh, you, you, you've done uh, maritime law, you've done insurance, you, you, you've done charter parties and, you know, so they're more oriented to the, uh, more oriented towards the uh, commercial side of shipping. So an ideal entry point for a seafarer in the commercial world would be operations, not straight away into chartering, right? Chartering is a whole different animal altogether. So, but once you get into operation, then you work very, very closely with chartering. And the good operations people, uh, most of the good operations people graduate into charter. Most of them, I've seen. But then, then there are not so many. But they do. A lot of them all over you. You'll, you'll find a lot of names. I don't have to take names. Just look around you. Look in. Uh, they all would. Uh, a lot of them have entered uh, doing an operations role and then become uh, become uh, you know have taken up uh, chartering roles. A few years in operations imparts sufficient knowledge and skills to the right person to move into a chartering function in the organization, whether it's a broker, whether it's an owner or a charter. The path is the same. You enter into operations job, you get into a, you know, you get into the broking, you get into the chartering job. Uh, it, it happens, but like I say, if, if there are 10 chartering guys, you probably find one chartering guy who's good for broking because any ship owner would want somebody who can, you know, uh, who can add value to the revenue earning side. He will, he will put him in there. Why not? Because otherwise he's a cost center. So let, let's make him a revenue generating center. It's just logic. So everybody looks for these, these kind of guys, everybody. A very common point of entry for ex seafarers is an operations job in a broking shop. That's the easiest, lowest level entry. Uh, but uh, I find most ex seafarers would prefer to get into either a charterer's, uh, charterer's office or an owner's office because the organizations are much bigger, and they would an image it. They would, they would probably find more job satisfaction on a short term basis or on a on a on a on an image basis than they would in a broking in a broking house function. So fresh graduates may find opportunities with brokers or in graduate management programs with owners and charterers, but this business is not very kind to fresh graduates. Uh, they want uh, they want experience at sea. If you want to come from a seafaring background and get into uh, and and get into a commercial function, uh, say operations or claims or whatever it is, they would want you to. They probably uh, want you to have some kind of seagoing experience in that. The second mates or third mates. There are, that's not to say, but these fresh graduates they 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 find it easier to get jobs in uh, in broking houses like a Clarkson's or a Brema or an SSY they, or even BRS for that matter. They do employ people, fresh, smart graduates from good colleges. Again, good personality, ability to sell, social skills and stuff like that. They take a few of these guys in and put them in through, you know, they put them in through different uh, verticals in broking shops. But uh, seafarers stand the best chance of making an, a lateral entry into the commercial. This is the last slide. You're muted. Sorry, there's one more. Uh, Shadow to the next slide, please. OK, it, this is something uh, all of you uh, must have heard uh, very often. Uh, you have to start from scratch. It's almost like becoming a cadet again. It is like becoming a cadet again because it's a whole, very different environment. Because uh, when you join a ship, you know exactly what to do, right? You, you come off your, let's say you're a fifth engineer, or you're a cadet, or you're a third mate. Uh, you, you know what to do because everything's written down in your in your manuals and stuff. You've done your exams and stuff, everything. You know, you, you know what uh, really needs to be done. But in a commercial environment, nobody's going to tell you what to do. In a commercial environment, you're expected to learn on your own or learn by uh, by watching other people. It's uh, more by induction than by uh, active, than by tutoring. Like I'm, if, if I get a brand new broker coming into my company, I'm not going to teach. He's going to sit next to me, see what I do and learn. That's the way. It's a hands-on learning experience. So that's why you have to learn. You have to be prepared to start from scratch and just leave your ego at the door. 
So there's no place for ego out there. Also, still dealing with ships, commercial environment is very diff is very different from a shipboard environment. Very, very different. It's a, a dog eats dog. The, the accountability is extremely high because straight away you're dealing with uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars, not millions of dollars. Straight away, better than a ship, you rarely think dollars. You, know? you just think of uh, I go for my watch or like yeah, I need this spare part or this, you know whatever. You don't think money on the ship. Unfortunately, seafarers are not uh, expected to financially manage the ships that they are on. They are they are operations people. They are functionaries. You need to have a thick skin and a determination to succeed. A thick skin, I say, because people in the commercial world are extremely good, and they can be extremely good. The reason being is that uh, they don't have much time. Uh, there's distance that separates you, and I don't know. You would have seen it's much easier to be rude uh, over an email or over a phone call than it is to be face to face. And because everything you're talking to people across continents and stuff, very often you'll find people being rude with you. Maybe with reason, maybe without reason, but it's something you just have to take it. It's part par for the course. And all the years of shipboard experience don't mean much, at least in the beginning of a show based career. You can very quickly prove yourself, very quickly gain the respect of your environment and your peers and everything, but it still takes some earning. And then finally, at the end of the day, the remuneration is just a fraction of shipboard wages. Like to, I gave you my example, right? Uh, it's just a, it's just a fraction, small fraction. But when you come ashore, just throw the money part out and say, "Hey, listen." Uh, I'm not worrying about the money right now. I'm just trying to make a place for myself, which I want to be in for the next 20, 25 years. I'll worry about the money a little bit later once I've got a hand the job and I've got a track record. And I've proved that uh, I know what I'm, I know that I, I, am, I am a value addition to the organization. But as I said, this, uh, the, the remuneration you start off with uh, may be very low in the beginning, but it catches up very quickly as your career progresses. Very quickly, uh, you, you'd be surprised how quickly. And that's about it. So I think uh, I'm ready for questions now, Riley. Right, right, sir. I'll just take one. Uh, you can go to the next slide, Shalom. I'll take one final question uh, from the audience. Uh, which country, as per you, is a commercial shipping hub? With Singapore, UK, US. India doesn't matter. You you mean you can be anywhere, and that's the last uh, option. For about seventy percent of you have voted. Look forward to more participation. All right, a few more answers, please. We'll have another 10 seconds. Uh, all right, let me end the poll. I think uh, in sharing the results, we have a clear winner as per the audience and that's uh, Singapore. Um, UK is a distant second. India is not in the picture, so is US. And yeah, third is actually Nota, doesn't matter. Uh, so, sir, if you could, uh, and Shalom, we go on to the next slide. If you could, you know, dwell on this a bit and uh, also, uh, you know, advise us about the current trends in terms of decision making. Where is it happening? Uh, where do you feel the, uh, you, you know, the industry is going towards uh, in, in commercial shipping? We have seen. Um, crewing, uh, we, we, we're seeing now technical operation, uh, HACQ coming to India. Um, uh, what, what do you think the country, the, the industry, the commercial shipping is going towards? See, Singapore is definitely, uh, has been voted as the single, is the largest shipping city in the world. It has overtaken London for quite a few years now. So probably the biggest fraternity of ship owning or, uh, or ship operations, whether it's trading or finance or whatever, uh, chartering, broking, Singapore is the largest. So it has uh, the, 
Yeah, so Singapore would probably be the largest shipping city in all terms of the world. It is one of the, it is the probably the largest port in the world as well because all of Singapore is a port. But uh, and as far as shipping jobs are concerned, yes, numerically there are a hell of a lot of shipping jobs in Singapore as well. Uh, you yes, London would pro actually number two. Yeah, London would probably be number two. Uh, then there's a toss up uh, with uh, number three. So let, let's just focus because 84, well, I, I guess if Singapore and UK are probably uh, the two largest shipping cities in the world. But uh, there are jobs uh, that are springing up and very surprising. Like Geneva has a lot of jobs uh, for shipping people, commercial shipping people, because so many traders, so many oil companies, most of the trading uh, operations globally have a presence in Geneva. Because uh, Geneva, the government, you know, the Switzerland is divided into cantons, and each canton has a has they have they has their own uh, taxation rules for business. So, uh, can the canton of Geneva is very very favorable towards trading houses and ship owners, so they give them lots of tax breaks. So you have a lot of people, a lot of entities setting up shop there. You have a lot of job. <coughs> Yeah, surprisingly enough, you have a commercial shipping job. Not so many, but I see a lot in the future coming up in Japan. So, uh, because Japan, you know, has a declining population. And uh, again, Indians are uh, uh, very, very, uh, Indians are very, very uh, numerically uh, present in operations and technical and quality. So in Japan, you, you, you find a lot of jobs springing up there. The US, of course, has jobs as well. So, but there are a lot of places in the world, like in Denmark, Copenhagen has a few jobs as well. So you, you, it's actually the spread is becoming much greater. It's not less. The number of jobs, uh, the number of locations is uh, increasing quite, uh, quite, 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 I'm pleasantly surprised to see how many different locations there are for these jobs. But yes, Singapore, UK, UK is uh, losing out to Singapore for sure. But so, but Geneva is gaining as well. And uh, there, there are a lot of Indians in uh, commercial shipping jobs in the US, New York and Houston and stuff like that. The oil companies, almost every oil company or oil, major oil trader has Indians in their uh, commercial shipping uh, section. Not so much in the, in the broking side as much. Although, yes, there are a lot of broking jobs where Indians in, uh, let me correct myself, sorry. There are a lot of Indians in uh, ship broking as well in almost all the major uh, broking houses globally. Uh, that's uh, simply because India is such a, in, the Indian economy is the fifth largest in the world now. We are major participants in, in the shipping industry. So uh, when the shipping in, uh, shipping interests grow, you'll, know, you'll find that the population uh, pertaining to that particular nationality also finds uh, space. Uh, job because there are jobs in India, jobs overseas, uh, wherever. So, uh, yeah, uh, there are plenty of uh, opportunities all over the world uh, in uh, uh, in shipping and commercial shipping, and and Indians are becoming a more and more accepted nationality. It it is very nationality based. But very often you'll find uh, jobs uh, advertised in the commercial shipping sector, and they will specify a nationality. So Indians are becoming more and more acceptable just because the business is so huge. Like India is the third largest importer of crude oil in the world. We're one of the largest exporters of crude of uh, petroleum products in the world. We are Reliance is the largest oil company in India. Uh, one of the largest uh, oil refining companies in the world. So uh, Dubai is becoming a very very major center for commercial shipping as well. So there are several. So uh, I, I believe the next time, if you, if you one year down the line, you'll probably find. Uh, uh, you know, there are about a bunch of uh, cities that are competing with each other. So I would say today it's Singapore, yes, London for sure, Geneva, Dubai. So these four are major. Uh, Hong Kong is contracting a bit uh, because of the political situation there. But uh, otherwise, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, Singapore, UK, Dubai, uh, Geneva. I, 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 I would term these four as major uh, shipping, uh, major centers of shipping dollars. Right, sir. Uh, no, thanks. Uh, 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 thank you for for uh, for letting us know, sir. H how would you say the trends are, sir? Uh, how how is the industry moving to now? What do you mean? Uh, which I mean, so for example, yeah, in a way that, for example, we see 
a lot of crewing is happening in india technical uh, management is happening hscq is now happening in india or started to happen technical at least um okay. there are a few Fine. jobs from the commercial side also which are now coming um uh, so but what do you see in the long run uh, would broking be done in india in, uh, in a major way or is it still being done is it increasing what are your thoughts on that sir broking is a major uh, has grown majorly in india uh, i've been in this business for 20 years so we probably have you know we had a handful probably five tanker brokers when i started off today there are at least 20 tanker brokers in india who are actively fixing so yes it's grown all the major broking houses globally have a presence in india but uh, broking uh, tends to uh, locate itself a broking shop tends to locate locate itself uh, where the uh, uh, where the financial control for shipping is either ship owning or control of the cargoes so indian the indian um, uh, economy being such or the rules and regulation being such where foreign foreign exchange transactions are not uh, the easiest uh, to execute in india so that's why you have places like dubai and singapore and well you know major financial centers which still house broking shops and uh, traders and other finance banks and stuff and ship owners because the tax rules and everything but uh, if india if india when i i it's a matter of time like you got gift city now in ahmedabad which is uh, which is a kind of a tax free regime and i i'm sure that will grow quite crazily and if shipping becomes a major aspect of gift city you will find a lot of broking shops setting up uh, in regimes like gift city as well so broking yes is i don't see broking uh, uh, disappearing uh, i mean uh, like uh, a ship broking because uh, it cannot be replaced by electronic uh, screen trading that's another topic for another uh, discussion but because uh, every voyage is unique every ship is unique and uh, they are not commodities they are not standardized commodities so you cannot have screen based trading that uh, that can handle uh, like a stock broker is mainly being become mainly screen based now you cannot have a ship broker who is screen based so i see ship broking as a future indians for sure if wherever the business moves like the center of gravity of the global economy is moving east that's why you found broking has come to uh, singapore and singapore only because singapore is uh, a major financial center which is a, which is welcome all the participants with open arms so uh, yes uh, ship broking is something major and uh, where where i see india <laughs> pleasantly surprised to see where you know players major traders like trafigura and vital and the owners like tk and top you know we always had crewing from india technical management started off on like small shops uh, you know a small operation like anglo eastern and a couple of others started small operations just for indian flagships but now that all that has changed i think tk does tk have a back office in india as well that's correct Yeah, so TK, Tom, you know, Zodiac has a black office. We all, Trafigura, all these guys have black offices in India. So operations and the commercial <laughs> operation is all the way in India. I see it's a matter of time before the number. Well, you have broking, ship broking rolls as well, but we need to have traders moving into India first. Major traders. The shipping is run by traders, right? Whatever commodity there is, the commodity is moved by traders. So when traders, when the when the regulations become such that traders set up offices in india then you'll find that uh, traders will also set up offices in india brokers will also come here financiers will come here ship owners will come here and that i think maybe next 5 to 10 years will find a very different story absolutely right sir there are a lot of questions which have come through while while you're speaking and uh, let's see how much time uh, would you have to answer these questions but i see at least 30 odd questions i'll i'll try and uh, you know moderate them accumulate uh, or or are the same questions which have been uh, uh, asked by a few persons and I'll, i'll i'll consolidate and ask those questions from you uh, or to everyone if you if a similar question has been asked please uh, you, you don't put that question now uh, but but i'll i'll try and uh, take all those questions uh, the first uh, uh, question or the most common question which i see is how do i get an entry into commercial space this question has come uh, from second officers from third engineers from chief engineers and from masters 
So A, uh, how any, any of person with a sailing background can enter into commercial shipping and is the entry path any different to um, what rank have you sailed on? It is easiest for a master mariner because a master mariner with command experience to graduate to a shipping role, to a shore based role from a, from a shipping role because a, a master mariner has management experience. Right, uh, he, he knows how to lead a team, or he has the experience, so that makes it easy. But uh, having said that, I know of plenty of second mates and third mates, radio ex radio officers uh, who have uh, made a place for themselves ashore. Now, the biggest negative or the biggest hurdle in front of people uh, when they want to make the transition from a, a, a sailing job to a shore based job is the belief that they cannot do it. It can be done. Just keep just keep throwing your CV around anywhere and everywhere, and uh, don't be too picky about the kind of job you get uh, first up. If you if you want it badly enough, you'll get it. But yes, you need to network. You need to be talking to your superintendents. Need to be put. And the easiest way to do it is with. P I told you, like uh, trust is a big issue in shipping, so it's best to it's best to try to uh, uh, connect with people who know you already. Maybe a chief engineer you sailed with, or a second engineer you sailed with, or a third engineer you sailed with, and now is in a shore based position. Go out, reach out to him. If he thinks you're worth it, there's a position, he may help you out. It's not easy, but nothing in life is easy. Getting get, Going out to sea was never easy, right? It's not easy. Even today, it's not easy, but you managed to do that. So, uh, uh, networking is the number one uh, method. Reach out to people, always have a CV ready. Uh, build up your CV, and uh, but I would suggest that people instead of trying to just jump ship and after one year as a second mate or a third mate or two or one year as a third engineer, fourth engineer, trying to get a shore based job just because you don't like sailing, that makes your job much harder. But if you are a second engineer or a chief engineer, getting into a shore based job or a second mate or a chief mate or a master, getting into a shore based job is easier, and that's only because you are uh, one of the main reasons because you are in touch with management people. You're in touch with superintendents, you're in touch with the fleet managers, you know, there are jobs, technical managers, uh, there are plenty of jobs ashore, there are, but you have to, yeah, but there are more people looking for those jobs than those are available, that's why it seems so hard, but there are jobs, and the deserving people normally get. Right, sir. So two points which you said, number one is network, uh, um, a, a lot, try and reach out to as many persons as you can. And second is that you should have a good CV. And that's where I feel a lot of mariners, they still use their company forms wherein height, weight, passport, CDC, COC, all those details are given, which are probably not relevant when you apply for a um, short job. Yeah, and one of the things that you should be highlighting in your CV is your non seagoing your experience other than what everybody else has. There's no point saying I've done a tanker safety course, I've done a firefighting course, I've done liquid cargo simulator course, everybody does that. You need it to say it. So it's not a big deal, right? So if you've done something else apart from that, like you've done an MBA, or you've done a diploma in finance, or you've done a diploma in, you've done your MICS, highlight those things. So, and it's always good. Just uh, add a, I mean, uh, try to beef up on your, uh, try to beef up on your uh, uh, qualification. Get get yourself a management degree. MBA matters a lot. I've seen a lot of MBA people, shippies who've done MBAs and have come ashore. People are impressed with an MBA. So right. I'm not saying it's a short shot to get your job, but it does matter. Right. So the third point is that uh, upskill yourself. Try and do some kind of differentiated uh, course. Uh, so that you at least get a few brownie pounds, a few few points more than what the others may It's have not been. only brownie points, right? You stand out because people right. believe that you've done this course, you've got some kind of knowledge which can be leveraged within the organization. Right. right? Why should I just take a master marina who's just been sailing, sailing, sailing and has done nothing else? Right. When I get a master marina with an MBA in finance or he's done, you know, or, or whatever. He's done a CFA's course or Whatever, something, you know, something, something that really stands out uh, in your CV. So uh, I'm not talking about a broking job. Yeah, broking jobs. If I see you, I know you can sell. Uh, you, you know, that's uh, the, that itself is a huge qualification because nobody, everybody can't sell. 
very few people can actually sell. So, but as far as regular seafaring jobs into operations, technical roles, the show go, it's extremely important to show some showcase, something outside of the box that you've done, outside of the grid that requires you to have done anyway to keep safe. Sir, I, I have a question. My name is Captain Pandey here. So, yeah, yeah. as you said, MBA in shipping and logistics or MBA in finance. So, which would be the better uh, like a field to go for like a MBA? You know, I would feel any related MBA, something that would add value to your existence in a shipping company would do, whether it's finance or whether it's operations or whether it's technology, sustainability, whatever. You need to stand out, right? And it's up, well, I would say an MBA in finance helps a lot. I would say a generic MBA, like in the US, if you do an MBA, you don't specialize in anything. You just do an MBA, right? It's not marketing, it's not finance, nothing. An MBA in itself is good enough. You don't have to specialize. It's only in India, I think, where people specialize. My son has done his MBA from Columbia University. He's not specialized in anything. He just, he's just done an MBA from Columbia. So an MBA in itself is an effective, uh, is, is something that will help you get noticed. A lot of people have done it. Right, sir. I, 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 we got disconnected with some internet issues. Uh, um, so so uh, what you've given is a guidance, general guidance of persons to enter into commercial shipping. Um, is... Uh, is there a preference that, uh, you know, a prospective employer would give to either a deck officer or engineer? Um, and is there anything different that an engineer may have to do? Because, I mean, he, they wouldn't have handled cargo uh, as, as much as deck officers would have. Um, um, so, yeah, anything different that an engineer could do? or uh, And how do prospective employers look uh, at, in, at a deck officer or an engineer? See, you know, there are a lot of engineers. I'm almost, most of the engineers in Reliance Chartering Department, or most of the chartering people in Reliance are engineers, a lot of them. So maybe in an oil company, an engineer would probably stand a better chance of uh, getting a commercial role. But then they enter at a much earlier level, at a much, much more junior level. So, but if it is a senior uh, or commercial or commercial role, then I feel a master man, a master mariner or a chief mate stands a better chance. Just as, you know, uh, just as a chief engineer would stand a better chance as a technical superintendent, a master mariner or a chief engineer would probably, or a chief officer would stand a better chance in the commercial. Because that's what we are trained. But it's not, never say never. I, I do know of a few brokers, uh, engineers, uh, brokers who've done their marine engineering and are, uh, uh, and are uh, working as brokers in booking houses. Right. And... Um, so essentially, uh, now I, I'm a master mariner or I'm a chief officer or a chief engineer. I've decided to get into commercial shipping. I'll probably try and upskill myself. I, I could do a certification course. Uh, I, I could do an MBA, a general MBA or a finance MBA. Once I do that, um, how, how do I, uh, start approaching companies? Uh, how, how do I, I mean, uh, what's the best way of approaching uh, do we just start to email CVs? Do we start to go, um, you know, identify those 10 companies, sit in a uh, place and then start visiting the office? Uh, how, how, what is your suggestion, please? Okay, let me just dial back a little bit. Uh, you have to decide very early in life if you want to quit C, right? Don't just think that after 20 years out and see like I did, okay, boss, 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 again, now we got to come out with bus. I, I, I don't want to sail anymore. I want to get into a short job. Right. Don't start planning for it at the end of 10 years or 20 years. Start planning for it well in advance. So the best deal, the best thing to do is do your MBA or do a do a master's degree in in maritime management or maritime operations or whatever. <clears throat> or even technology. Today the, the, the shipping is very, very technology driven. So even a even a, a degree in technology or qualification in technology will there's so many companies like uh, like Vason and Amos, and I don't know what Amos is called now. A lot of these technology companies which run systems, uh, so they would also they would also have place for master mariners. I know there's one guy who lives in my building. He works for Vison. He's a master mariner. So it, 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 it is a commercial role, but it is like it is supporting commercial shipping in uh, in IT enabled services or whatever IT services whatever. 
So decide well in advance that you want to you want to quit. Decide, uh, and everybody should uh, make up their own minds as to what their own strengths are. We should know your strength. Like I, from a very early age in life, whether it was sensible or not, a very early age during my career, even though I didn't, I don't have any other uh, basic qualifications. Whatever it is, uh, maybe at my age, I was at my stage in life when I entered. I was lucky. The competition was not so intense, but the opportunities were much less as well. So I, uh, uh, I just said, okay, fine. But I always knew I wanted to go into a commercial role. I always knew that. Now. today the opportunities you guys have including the money that you guys earn today the if you make up your mind 5 or 10 5 years or 10 years in advance of the fact that you want to quit you have so many opportunities to upskill yourself and and great i mean you can go to london and do your you know what you go to city university and do your uh, what's it called uh, i don't know what's that course called in city university um, the base uh, yeah this is uh, ंग so uh, the question to you uh, was primarily uh, do you see any opportunity or any business opportunity from a consulting point of view within these uh, ship broking companies see so you you talked about that ship broking companies primarily involve financial due diligence and then they would be uh, brokerage uh, what you call as uh, a sort of deal advisory sort of thing so are there any inroads or a business opportunity for a consulting firm to basically connect with uh, say ship broking uh agent to have a consulting business from them ship broking they're basically you know i mean uh, they're very very uh, money minded i don't know if they want to spend a few 100000 dollars or a few million dollars on a consulting uh, project so no okay. i wouldn't say that ship brokers ship brokers are very comfortable in their own skin they think that nobody can teach them anything they know everything that needs to be done to to carry out ship broking but very frankly ship broking is not that complicated that you require a consulting function at least not yet i don't know maybe if a big one you know one of the big uh, broking houses like clarksons or brema these public listed companies maybe they the, 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 there would be space because uh, the last i heard clarkson is a billion dollar company the market cap is a billion dollars so yes i mean uh, clarksons you 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 would probably find uh, some room for some kind of traction in a company like clarkson but there are very few like clarkson most of the broking companies their net worth is few million dollar 10 20 40 50 million dollars you know so i don't know if consulting would have uh, any tra- get any traction there i think it would probably be more in uh, ship owning companies or shipping departments of uh, chartering companies and stuff like that. Uh, yes actually we are like currently working with a lot of like these port authorities in india as well as well as in uh, uk and the hong kong and apart from those the port authorities then the other target segment for us is primarily these like the mol or the msc they have their tech divisions wherein they want to improve the port performance or basically do a complete port process mapping so that segment is basically uh, set for us but yeah i as the manager was uh, trying to explore the idea of like getting into Uh, say uh, brokering uh, consulting business 
So that's right. Clarkson, because they are the only ones I imagine who would do it because they are the only real broking company of size. Everybody else is more or less like a small cottage industry. Even Brema, Brema is much smaller than is also another public listed uh, ship broking company, but they are probably I don't know fifteen twenty percent. I know I don't know. Uh, I don't know how big they are, but uh, they are much smaller than Clarkson's. So okay. maybe a company like Clarkson's could you could target. Yes. I'm okay. not giving any guarantee, but maybe they could because they're huge. Okay. Clarkson's is massive. And so, just uh, just a, a separate question from this, like uh, apart from uh, business opportunity, what would be the perspective for me if I, as a manager from uh, say Deloitte, want to get into an altogether different field of say uh, port broking or ship broking industry? So, how do you think the acceptance would be there in shipping? Considering I didn't sail for a long time, and then I have around ten years of experience into consulting. Again, you know, for you. Uh... I mean, never say never. Like, if you if you if you if you if you're uh, passionate about uh, selling and you think you can make a go of uh, broking, yeah, sure. But it will. It's it's not a normal uh, path, in the sense that from a consulting, and you'll find it very very different. You'll find it much less complicated. You'll find uh, it. You, you 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 probably will not find yourself as intellectually challenged as you're probably in in uh, consulting. Understood, sir. It's much more a street smart uh, activity. Yes, sir. Yeah, it, it's tough. It, it's difficult. It's critical. But uh, I think consulting is probably requires more intellectual capital. Yeah, understood, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and there are a few more questions, sir, which have come. And uh, these questions are: I've been into say uh, crewing. I've been into ops. I've been into HSEQ. I've been in 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 another field related to um, uh, shipping, but not commercial shipping. And I now want to get into commercial shipping. Uh, what can I do? Uh, is, is, are, are these are the questions? And just uh, what what I have seen, sir, is um, um, uh, that these guys are probably at a certain salary bracket, uh, and uh, their experience may not be so relevant when they come into broking, and hence. Uh, they would have to take a you know significant wage cut, and which probably the industry uh, uh, or 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 uh, uh, the commercial shipping may not uh, uh, hire them uh, at at that salary level. So it becomes difficult for them to kind of get into uh, co commercial shipping. Um, that that's what I feel is is that correct, sir? And, and your take on you know person switching from department from one department to another while they have. Yeah, it all experience. depends on what somebody wants to do. Right. I mean, uh, at the end of the day, shipping ship, shipping organizations are sure they have a lot of, there's a variety of uh, background that make a home for themselves there. So, uh, but I, I am, I am a, I'm a great believer in core competency. So if you, if you, if you developed a core competency in a certain, in a certain uh, avenue or certain sphere, I would suggest that you go and capitalize on that. If you really feel that commercial shipping is your forte, give it a crack again. You know, I mean, <clears throat> you're taking a risk, but then what is life without risk? You're taking a risk, so reach out to people you know who are there, who are in commercial shipping and look for, uh, and look for uh, placements within that. But again, if you're going outside of your core competency, it depends on what your age is, what your experience is and everything. So uh, it, it, it's a bit of taking a risk, but if you're not happy doing what you're doing and you're very sure you're going to be happy in commercial shipping, give it a crack. But it's taking a risk, and you know risk can go either way. It can go, it can go up, it can go down. I mean, you know, so it's it, it's totally a personal call. How how committed and how determined and how convinced you are that you need to take it. But per, for me, do not ever abandon core competency without uh, giving it deep thought. Sure, sir. Uh, makes a lot of sense. Sir, how much time do you have uh, with so many more questions? How much time do you have? So I will <clears throat> kind of finish up. Uh, Maybe another 15 minutes. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Um, Manish uh, has had raised his hand as well. Uh, has raised his hand. And Manish, do you want to speak? Uh, yeah, what yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot for uh, uh, I mean, giving the chance. Uh, sir, I would like to know. Uh, I uh, am I audible? Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. You are. Yes, sir. I, I actually last year I was uh, willing to. Uh, I've uh, cleared my chief engineer's exam, and uh, right now I am selling a second engineer. 
I wanted, uh, I was inquiring about the ICS course, uh, International Ship Broker and Chart. Uh, uh, there's a college in London which um, uh, makes you do this course. Is it advisable to do that course? Uh, it will give a, a added advantage. You don't have to go to the college in London. All you got to do is become, uh, go through the Indian, uh, there is an Indian chapter of uh, Institute of Chartered Ship Brokers. So you yeah. could register with them and give the and uh, you could probably uh, do the exam from here instead of spending all that money and doing it through England. Yeah, but uh, I think uh, the written exams can be done in Mumbai, right? As yeah. of uh, Mumbai, yeah. Delhi, Mumbai, Delhi, Delhi. Chennai. Also. Yeah, uh, is it advisable to do it? Uh, will it give an adv uh, added advantage to get into uh, brokerage? It will definitely give you a foundation. I'm not saying it's an added advantage. Give you a foundation. At least you understand what uh, what commercial uh, shipping is all about. It is purely a commercial course, and if you choose your subjects wisely, and uh, yeah, you 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 can uh, gain quite a bit of knowledge about commercial. So, uh, uh, can you just advise which subjects to be chosen uh, uh, to have? Uh... No, it's a little difficult yes. for me to say that because I'm not sure as a chief engineer what subjects you get uh, offer with a chief's ticket, what subjects you get exemptions for. Uh, I have heard the uh, three of the sub, uh, two of the subjects I get exempted, sir. Total right. eight uh, uh, in eight subjects, I think I get uh, exempted for two subjects. I need to give six uh, odd subjects, in which three subjects will be compulsory and three subjects will be of my own choice. So I wanted to know which choice can we uh, I prefer for. Uh, what is your sailing background? Uh, sailing background: fifteen years uh, uh, in shipping uh, with. Uh, ships? Uh, containers, sir. Okay, then I think there's a you'd probably find a, a course for liners. You'll have to do. Uh, I think there's a, is, is there a liner chartering course? Like it's a long time since I did this course. I don't know what the options are. But if there's a course for liner uh, liner chartering, you could probably do that. Uh, do dry bulk chartering. Then there's a uh -huh. sale and purchase course. So anything that catches your fancy, because the description of uh, anything that you think you you find it easy to clear. See, uh, the problem is, sir, uh, uh, as you are saying, uh, brokerage. Normally, I am never. Uh, I wanted to be a, bro a broker. I want. Uh, I am willing to be a broker. But then, uh, what all these courses? Uh, when once I select the courses, will it be helpful for the brokerage or not? I am not sure. Once you've done so MICS, no. once you've done your MICS, nobody really asks you what you've done, what papers you've passed or not. They just want you to have the basic qualification. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Like I told you, it's, there's no guarantee you'll get a job with MICS. A lot of people have MICS. You uh -huh. have to do something over and above that. Say an MBA. Like uh, like my my strong uh, recommendation is an MBA, which again is not 100% uh, sure that you'll get a job. But an MBA, yes, will give you some kind of a leg up. So that means uh, it is better to do uh, MBA rather than ICS, you say? I would think so, yes. But then, uh, yeah, I would think so. But ICS is not a bad course because, like I told you, it's a very good foundation in commercial ship. A very uh, good foundation. Course. It's okay. a little expensive, I know. But uh, I don't know how much it costs now. But uh, I still think ICS is a very good course. Okay. Okay, so, uh, so you suggest uh, I can go to Mumbai and ask them personally and uh, get to know much uh, about the course this uh, manish is i have done ics uh, write to us at education at the rate cnbeyond.com the least that i can do is i have some educational material with me i had some past uh, question papers which are freely available i can share them with you you will have a, a view of uh, of what kind of questions are being asked and and then you can possibly you know take things uh, from there but as as sir mentioned i think it, it's it's good to have it will not guarantee you a job but it will definitely uh, uh, have differentiate you from others who are applying okay can you share the email id again sir uh, if you uh, we will you write it down um, uh, shall we just write the email id down education at the rate cnbeyond.com sure thank you sir thanks a lot sir We'll take the last three questions now, and uh, we will. Uh, so I know there are a lot of persons who have raised their hands as well. Can you please write your questions in the chat window? We may not have that much of uh, time. I saw your question, iPhone, um, and uh, so essentially, sir, it's a, a, a good question which he has. He's a second officer. He's working uh, in ops department. Um, 
uh, in in India. So his uh, question is: Should he be, uh, you know, moving ahead within this same domain, uh, work ashore in the office department and try and move into chartering or broking, or go back uh, get his master's COC, sail, and and then try and come back again? Sorry, could you just repeat that? Gone. Sorry, I lost you. Right. Sir. No, so a second officer working ashore in commercial ops. Uh, he wants to get into chartering. Does he continues in the shore job and probably he'll get uh, through chartering or does he go back, sail, get his master's ticket, sail as master and then come and apply for uh, broken chartering? Uh, if he wants the chartering job, uh, desperately just stick where you are and try to get into, continue in operations and get into the chartering world. Uh, being a master mariner is not really going to help you uh, in, a, in, a, in a commercial chartering. In fact, the earlier you get into a charting role, the better it is. Right, right. Right, sir. Um, thanks. There are another couple of questions which had come through. Um, most of the opportunities persons see are in tier one cities, Mumbai, Chennai. Uh, uh, so the question is, would there be opportunities, uh, uh, do you foresee uh, opportunities coming in tier two cities? And by any chance, would remote opportunities uh, be available um, in 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 the commercial space in the coming time as well. No commercial. I think because of the security involved and the confidentiality involved. I think uh, unless it's a pandemic like situation, I think uh, people will always prefer you to work out of the office. But of course, if you if you if you are an old, if you have a track record, you've been an employee for a long time, once in once in a while or. <laughs> circumstances permitting people will not mind you working from home. You will work from home many, many times. Yeah, I mean, but uh, the essential place of work will be the office. I don't see remote uh, opportunities arising in commercial space. It's only because of the confidentiality. Right. And especially if you're trying to break in, you don't break in with the view that you will start to get uh, um, uh, work from home opportunities, maybe over a period of time you might get. And tier two cities, you can never, you know, get tier one cities is only because all the companies are there. You know, I mean, all the companies are headquartered there. They have offices there. That's where the jobs are there. When the if the if if the tier two cities become big enough, and the shipping industry in India becomes big enough, expands enough into tier two cities, the jobs will go there. The jobs are where the companies reside. Right. Now, I, right. I'm talking purely of the commercial jobs. Yeah, there are a lot of jobs in tier two cities like remote jobs, like remote vetting and stuff like that. I'm not even getting into that. There are plenty of opportunities as far as that is concerned. But I'm not the I, I'm not the person. Uh, I, I don't have expert knowledge. I I understand, sir. Um, um, Satyajit has a question. He's a marine superintendent. Uh, um, and uh, so what are the changes that he could make adjustment changes in his profile if he wants to get into commercial shipping um, uh, and, and so we have he's a marine uh, superintendent right where is he a marine superintendent a marine. Um, so so HACQ superintendent and he wants to get from HACQ superintendent he wants to move to commercial uh, space see since he's already working in a shore based organization that is an that's an advantage, okay? Because he has an operations desk, he has a chartering desk sitting in close vicinity of where he is. Just show an interest in uh, operations and chartering and try to network with these guys and look if there's an option or there is a there is a slot available there. So one day you'll find somebody's up and left and you've been saying, I want to work in this capacity and they say, okay, let's see what you can do. But one of the ways to do it, I would suggest that, okay, do your ICS. Uh, like I told you, it's a great foundation course. If, if you've not already done it, do an MBA, uh, qualify yourself commercially, uh, organize, like you should have evidence of an organized commercial thought process and then and put it up in, and put, uh, insert it in your CV and you'll find that uh, people automatically, organization automatically starts taking you seriously. Is that simple? Upskilling sure. is the name of the game and stand out from the guy next to you. Sure, sure. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, one final question. Uh, um, now, how, how would you rate uh, maritime law? Uh, it's a very, you mentioned about it's a very good option. It's, it's a very, very good option, but it's not as wide as uh, commercial shipping. 
but if you do maritime law you could get uh, you you could get a kind of an entry into commercial shipping as well not guaranteed but people look at you with interest it depends on what if 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 you're specializing in commercial law or admiral whatever you know uh, disputes or whatever but i would say maritime law in its own is a great field uh, there are opportunities in that you could become a maritime lawyer you get you could get involved with pni clubs uh, because they are looking for uh, i mean they are applying maritime law all the time so you could get involved with classification societies but not so much but i think pni clubs who in salvage and all these insurance companies would take you there are a lot of jobs in insurance companies commercial uh, shipping jobs in insurance companies which if you have a maritime law or a maritime insurance or a maritime insurance qualification they would probably take you very uh, they would take you seriously as well if you apply all the big all the big insurance companies all over the world they have a huge uh, uh shipping insurance book and yeah you could find place there but i find yes uh, maritime law would be very interesting but not so many shippies uh, focus on that or try to get a qualification right right i i seen mahadev has raised his hand and his ra- ra- hand has been raised for quite some time so Ma- that's the last question to you sir uh, from mahadev mahadev do you want to speak up yep hi hi captain sharma and captain mahadev uh kapil sharma i have been in commercial shipping since uh, last 3 4 years uh, and uh, now i am uh, doing uh, now i am basically pure into the chartering with a, a good company so just wanted to know that uh, since the india is coming up as we talked about the gift cities and all uh, so but do we really think that uh, companies are interested to come to the gift city uh, to uh, start their base it all depends on what the regulatory regime pans out to be right shipping or is always looking for a tax free regime in fact you'll find shipping does not thrive anywhere except in a benign tax regime so if a gift city provides a, a benign tax regime to ship owner ship owners and traders and financiers yeah they will come i'm very sure they'll come i find gift city a very intriguing concept but then it's not i mean the the deregulation so to say is not really moving a pace as quickly as it should it's actually a it's still about 10 to 20 years behind most other uh, <clears throat> like uh, probably it's about 30 years behind singapore as far as uh, financial deregulation yeah, that is correct because uh, uh, where i am uh, that we also started to you know uh, register a company there but uh, the still the tax laws are so stringent uh, even in the gift cities it's not that free so that's why i thought if you have could more clarity on this i have attended a couple of seminars where they have described uh, what gift city aims to do see at the end of the day gift city is still in the hands uh, of the government of india it's still a very bureaucratic uh, enterprise so we have to and uh, they are finding it very difficult to delink uh, gift cities tax regime from uh, you know from the rest of the indian uh, tax regimes the indian penal code indian civil code the, the indian tax code so i'm no expert on this but that's the impression i got so until and unless they uh, totally you know they 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 go the way say say a geneva goes or a singapore goes or an isle of man goes you will not find uh, shipping interests uh, moving into gift city uh, in the in the short term but i do believe that uh, i do believe that uh, there is potential there but again it depends on how they proceed with the deregulation even now it's only a 10 year tax free regime you know the yes. tax free tax free state is only for 10 years, years. so yeah. i think they, i think i think they need to evolve a little bit okay thank you captain sharma yeah. let's answer pooja pooja has got a hand up so go ahead pooja go ahead last question now pooja you want to speak up uh, yes sir good afternoon sir this is um, uh, i am pooja gosavi uh, selling as chief engineer uh, planning to shift to shore uh, so we, now i got to that mba is better of better to do so in that which one uh, to choose like uh, general or uh, f- uh, finance and from uh, which uh, colleges well okay i am not an education expert but i would probably feel a, a, an mba a general mba would probably be a good bet it will stand you in good enough stead but remember it uh, one one thing that is a weak spot as far as the uh, sea going personnel go is finance 
So because we don't really understand balance sheets and cash flows and stuff like that. So yeah, an MBA in finance would probably be a good advantage. But I'm not sure which college. Probably Gaurav can help you. Okay. Now I think there have been a few questions which uh, have been asked, and uh, those questions were. Uh, how can C and Beyond help uh, help help you guys, right? So just to let you know, uh, through C and Beyond, we started with the concept of mentoring, right? In mentoring, we have various fields where a person could go. Um, uh, uh, we can help you based on your personality, based on your uh, thought process, your uh, um, um, aspiration. We can tell you which field might be better for you. We can connect you to relevant experts as well. So that's how we have helped in choosing you a career, right? Second is how can you choose a college or a course, right? So we are tied up with 40 universities, including, uh, you know, the base business school, including Solent, including uni maritime universities in Greece, uh, Cyprus, Netherlands, France, uh, where who have maritime economics, maritime law, international trade, port management courses. So uh, reach out to us and we can tell you that what are the advantages, disadvantages of a particular university. You can go on our website, you can just compare the few courses as well and you will get uh, an idea by yourself. So that's the second way that we can help. Uh, third is, you know, we have uh, CVs and LinkedIn. We can uh, get your CV made. We can have your LinkedIn ID made. And fourth, last but not the least is getting you a job. So we are partnered to more than 120 companies worldwide. Uh, and um, so we help them in the short jobs. We are not into selling jobs. We can help you at least get your CV uh, possibly to a company which is looking for opportunities. You cannot go to 120 companies by on your own. We could support you in getting to those companies. Um, hopefully, you know, there has to be a relevant opening as well. Uh, so that's how CN Beyond can uh, help you. So if you have any query, um, if you have any, um, um, uh, you know, uh, this thing that, that you would like to be clarified, I'm just writing a email ID, uh, education at the rate cnbeyond.com. Uh, please write to us and we should be able to help you over there. Uh, we are also planning to start some online courses and that's the reason why I put a poll on and we, most of you could see it on your screen, uh, which is upskilling. Would you be interested in upskilling in a commercial uh, shipping world? So these could be certification courses or full-time courses. Um, and I, I see most many of you have voted. Um, let me end the poll and uh, share results um, as well. So yeah, 64% of you are looking at short term uh, certification courses. And honestly, um, I don't know how you feel, sir, but I feel the world or is going towards these kind of courses. And I see companies also willing to hire persons based on certain skills which they have gained rather than you know an msc mba uh, because for them those skills are probably uh, sufficient for for a person to function so for example many companies i i and, and i'm just assuming may give a weightage to mics uh, uh, equally as as uh, to an mba as, as well because for them uh, you have the relevant skill again it's a question of how many how many cvs you receive you receive with short-term certification, how many CVs you receive with a full-time MBA? You know? I'd obviously look at a full-time MBA more seriously than with a short-term certification. But depending on the role I'm looking at, depending on the role I'm looking to fill. So it's how you, CVs are all, that's, that's just the very initial stage of competition. You know? So basically you should tailor it so that it stands out and uh, it, it gets shortlisted. So get, you get called for an interview. So uh, that's that's the value of a CV. But uh, I think a full term, a full time MBA, I, I'm a great fan of that. I haven't done it myself. I wish I had. But uh, I think I'm a great fan of full time MBA. Right, sir. Right. Noted. Um, so just for everyone, I mean, uh, I had asked for time from Captain Sharma. He gave me one hour time. 
I have taken one hour and fifty minutes, and that's <laughs> you know double the time that that he has promised. And uh, I know there are questions which are pending, and there will be questions which will always remain pending. But you know, uh, reach out to us. Uh, we'll try and uh, you know maybe consolidate the questions, give it to Captain Sharma or other experts, and try and get their views, and then reach out to you. Uh, but I'm sorry, we may not be able to take all the questions. <laughs> um i i i am just uh, this is the final uh, i'm taking a final uh, feedback poll and uh, this feedback is uh, were your expectations met uh, the three questions was the session useful to you uh, how would you rate the session uh, and there's a scale from 1 to 10 uh, please feel free to rate the session uh, zero being uh, i mean it wasn't useful 10 being it was very useful uh, more importantly, if you would want any, um, um, you know, improvements, anything else that we could uh, possibly help you with a better format, uh, do re do put it in the chat window and we'll try and, um, you know, uh, bring those points, inculcate those uh, things in our uh, webinars, which we would do uh, over a period of time. And maybe Captain Sharma, we might want you for another webinar. I'm sure there will be a lot of demand. Uh, Excuse me, the... Captain Kaurav, uh, I have a question, a very short question. I'm just interrupting you in between. Actually, as you said, it is a very short webinar and, and many of the mariners don't have a chance and also to attend. Two hours of... Two hours. No, no. I, I'm saying that because most of the time we are working, a show, you know, uh, on ships. So we sometimes don't have a proper connectivity also. And uh, as you can understand uh, why people have voted for the short courses be because of the because of the short period uh, when we are coming for the vacations. So that is why we have voted for the short term certification courses. So based on this, uh, as Captain Sharma is also saying that we should go for a long term course, but I don't think so. It would be possible for everyone to go for a long term course. I hope you understand this point very well. And uh, so, and as Captain Sharma is also correct that without long-term course, we won't be suitable for the correct, uh, you know, position also. So what is the ultimate solution to handle this? Make a sacrifice, make a choice and make a sacrifice. All right, sir. All right. Uh, it, it depends on what you want because, uh, you know, I, I was down for my master's for a year. So, I mean, I got married and all that stuff. So, it's not unusual for a shippy to stay ashore for a year, right? But sir, sacrifice, sacrifices are only done once you are, you know, uh, financially strong. Yes. If you are. So, so all, the, all that, that, that structuring you have to do for yourself. So, like I said, your salaries nowadays are not bad at all. You get decent salaries and depends on what level you you are uh, yeah actually working. actually the dry bulk is the most uh, i can say is the lowest field and comparatively gas tankers and other uh, tankers background they are paying very well paid why so, did you try correspondence then yes sir no you can an sir? mba by correspondence from a decent university is also an option yeah, that 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 is why I was looking for. So I was I was just going and Google through even your suggestions only. So it's one year would be also sufficient to do that. One year there are some so universities. So many executive MBAs are one year courses, no? Yes. See, listen, uh, just I am hung up on MBAs. I may not be. I may not be the. I'm not an education expert. I'm just telling you as a person who goes through CVs every now and then. If I see an MBA. I'm more impressed than if I see a short-term certification. And that's the truth of the matter. So, I mean, uh, I'm not saying that if you have a short-term certification, you won't land up a job. You might land up a much better job than the next MBA does. Definitely. <laughs> it's all a question of, uh, see, shipping is a lot about being at the right time at the right place. And if you keep taking your chances, you keep uh, applying for jobs, you keep looking around, throwing your CV around, one day you will get that for sure if you want it badly enough one day you will get uh, you 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 will get uh, the uh, you opportunity. will get the chance that you the yes. opportunity I, i'm very sure you but sure. you have to want it badly enough 
definitely that inspiration and, and uh, interest should be there Hundred, the, the, yeah i mean it, persistence perseverance these two things without this you can't go anywhere anyway. patience perseverance and persistence these three you cannot do without this sure sir sure thank you so much sir thank you both of you thank you Sure, sure. Thanks, Vijay. If you need any support in terms of choosing a course, do write to us. Um, and it goes uh, to you, Sahil, as well. I know you have a question which is un unanswered. But uh, please write to us on education at the rate cnbeyond.com and we will surely revert to you. We have partnered to about 40 odd colleges. Most of all of them are in Europe, Canada, USA, um, um, and now uh, in Australia as well. And we should be able to support you in upskilling um, either through distance learning, either through full-time courses, and hopefully uh, certification courses, which is our upcoming offering. Um, and I, I, I'm sorry, we may have, uh, I mean, uh, uh, not answered uh, all of your questions. Uh, we'll have to probably let Captain uh, Sharma go. I can stay back. I can answer a few of your questions if you would like. But I've already taken double of the time that I had asked from Captain Sharma. Um, so, just Captain Sharma, thank you so much for your time. Uh, um, uh, extremely, extremely insightful sessions. It came straight from the heart. Um, a, a few things which you said, you know, commercial shipping is capital intensive, but not labor intensive, you know, uh, made a lot of sense. Um, uh, upskill yourself, uh, upskilling through uh, MBA um, uh, uh, is, is, is what you would say is, is preferred. A full time program is, is what is preferred. Um, doing an M MICS would, of course, help, but it will not guarantee you a job. Um, um, so, uh, you know, you, you told us about the life or what uh, different persons within a commercial shipping do, uh, broking, claims, uh, operations, and, and all of those were very, very um, helpful, sir. Uh, we might reach out to you for another session in a few months, uh, in a few weeks, but thank you so much for your time, sir. It was extremely insightful and, and thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks, Gaurav. I enjoyed that. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. Thank, thank you. Bye bye. Bye all. Bye. 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 Thank you, sir. Thank you.